Good afternoon. We are so pleased to be partnering with the Kirsten Public Library and to have all of you joining us for this event in the Moving Words Writers Across Minnesota virtual series featuring the talents of Susan Bartlett Foote, Carrie Griffith, Christopher Lehman, and Andrea Swenson. I'm Wendy Worden, Programs and Services Assistant at the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. As we get started today, we would like to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which I broadcast. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also want to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota, and we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. The Friends has coordinated the year-long Minnesota Book Awards program for 14 years, and as Minnesota's Center for the Book, we produce programming that benefits all ages and reaches all corners of the state. This programming is supported by the funding for the Center for the Book included in Minnesota's K-12 Education Bill, and we are grateful to all the state representatives and senators who advocated for that funding. On to our main event. This series is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Department of Education, and additional support is provided by the Harlan Boss Foundation for the Arts, Northern Lights Library Network, and Education Minnesota. We will have a reading and conversation followed by a Q&A with you, our audience. Biographies of each panelist will be posted in the chat and we'll be following up this program with a brief survey to get your feedback. We have partnered with Next Chapter Bookseller in St. Paul to purchase books from our featured authors, so please visit their website or your favorite local bookseller to, put, to purchase books. And we'll put links in the chat throughout the program, so please feel free to pop your questions into that chat all throughout, and I will relay them to our featured author. My, my friend Amelia will will help give us give us a hand throughout the program. To start things off, we'll have a brief reading and presentation from each author. And first, I'll welcome Susan Bartlett Foote, Professor Emerita at the University of Minnesota, and the author of The Crusade for Forgotten Souls. So, Susan, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, um, a real pleasure to introduce uh, this audience to my book, The Crusade for Forgotten Souls, which is the story of reforming Minnesota's mental institutions, 1946 to 1954. It's a little known story, but it's a critically important Minnesota story of ordinary people who successfully fought for reform of the deplorable mental asylums where 15,000 Minnesotans were incarcerated in seven large institutions during the 1940s. The reform catapulted Minnesota from among the worst of all the states to a model for other states to follow. <clears throat> I learned of this reform effort totally by accident when papers in my son's closet fell on my head while I was helping him move. Why did he have them? His grandfather, who was my former father-in-law, had been a leader of the effort in the 1940s. And in those papers were scrapbooks of clippings from newspapers, old speeches, speeches and harrowing photos. I learned that by reading these fascinating materials that Governor Luther Youngdahl was credited with the effort. And I found his, uh, the only biography of his and in it, in a description of this mental health activity, it said it all started with Angla Shea, an attendant in Minnesota's mental hospitals. And I thought, who is she? Her name never appeared in any of the papers that I found, the newspaper articles. And I went on a hunt. Uh, I found a bare minimum at first, and then I searched for descendants. She had um, no, uh, she never married and had no children, but I found a great, great niece who had her in, in Wisconsin, 
who had her diaries and autobiographical stories. Unbelievable resource. And I knew I had to share English A with the world. Let me get, um, here's a picture of, of, the, of Angla. She was a Norwegian immigrant's daughter, born in 1895 in Marshall County, way up north, those in Crookston uh, uh, certainly know, her town of New Folden. And I think people will uh, really enjoy reading the stories of her childhood with its financial and emotional challenges. Um, she was a little girl with no money, no connections, and little education. And the question is, how did she become Minnesota's first mental health advocate and her work lead to this uh, statewide change? She's the little girl standing there in the stripes <laughs> uh, in front of her, her family's homestead. And the picture below is, is uh, Angla at about the time uh, these reform efforts began to take place. How did she become this advocate? She tells us in an autobiographical story. Um, in 1926, her beloved father checked himself into Fergus Falls State Hospital in a deep depression, and her visit to him was a turning point in her life. And here's a picture uh, right here in the top there is marked as, as Fergus Falls, a terribly uh, intimidating place, which held several thousand inmates, as they called them at the time, uh, that her father was incarcerated there. Here's an uh, excerpt from the story. Don't you remember, Dad, how you always said how we understood each other and how I'd always be your own little girl as long as we both lived? Then after a long pause, the daughter said, listen, dad, I'm that same little girl. No, you'll never be my little girl anymore, the father replied. There are too many years between us now. The years can't change things between us, dad. We still understand each other, wept the daughter. Don't you remember? I don't want to remember. I want to forget the past. I have been all my life so alone. At the hotel room that night, she tried to piece together her father's tragic life and cursed fate that it should have dealt thus with such a wonderful man. It was obvious he didn't want anyone around to remind him of his old life. Devastated, she began to despair. Then she had an epiphany. Quick as a flash, it came to her what she must do. She would go forth and do all she could to improve conditions in mental hospitals. That was the best way to help her father. At that fateful visit in 1926, Angla Shea found her calling. And by the late 1930s, she had crashed the gates, as she said, and became an attendant, the lowest paid personnel at Anoka State Hospital. This is a picture of some of the uh, different hospitals, as I said. Uh, and here are contemporaneous photographs of what the conditions were like in the hospitals when Angla started there. In, she wrote incredible diaries, and I'm now gonna read a little bit from her diary in, 19, um, in the early 1940s when she had just arrived at Anoka. She said, I refuse to put a patient in camisole, camisole being the straight jackets, and you can see that in the in the two women in the picture in the corner. I refused to put a patient in camisole straight off the bat and I took a patient who had crouched like a dog on a leash, tied in a six stool toilet out on a porch and I objected to camisole patients having all of their supper, including dessert and liquid served in a tin bowl and scooped into them like slopping the hogs. So I got off to a bad start. Angla was targeted by the supervisors for trying to make things better, reprimanded and threatened. Um, and yet she wrote in diaries stories of individuals, the patients who she befriended. She gives them names and tells their stories. And you know, as I was writing this now, I kept thinking of what's going on right now, the 
say their names, say their names. And Angla with people as forgotten as many of the people we now uh, realize in, in so many other modern circumstances, she said their names and told their stories. And those, um, those stories are so valuable uh, for us now trying to understand these conditions. She began to work for change without success. And um, when there was some national attention to conditions during war times in World War II, and it's a very interesting story we, we can't go into here, but you'll read it in the book, there had been an expose in Life magazine at the national level, although the state newspapers in Minnesota denied there were problems. That gave Angla the idea to begin to work for change outside the system. She identified churches, unions, and writers as likely allies and encountered the Unitarians who were a very small church um, uh, who, who showed some interest. And she was invited to a statewide conference of Unitarians who were thinking about maybe there were problems in Minnesota's institutions. Um, she got to the conference. Many people there believed the state's version that there were really no problems in Minnesota. And in her diary, she wrote, when someone said, we have gone to the highest authority, we have talked to the superintendents, I stood up and volunteered, you have not gone to the highest authority. These men are so far removed from the patients and low level personnel, they don't even know what's cooking. Take a dance band out and dance with the patients. Then you will get an idea about what needs to be done in mental hospitals. This small group of Unitarians took up the call, um, relying on Angla for inside information on what was really going on. And the book recounts their effective social justice strategy, how they engaged political leadership, uh, brought the issue to um, a wide range of Minnesota citizens, and persuaded a member of the press to tell the truth. And my last slide um, shows a picture of the governor, Luther Youngdahl, who could not have done this work without Anglache and the group that she engaged signing the legislation. And the bottom picture is an iconic one of Luther Youngdahl at Anoka State Hospital burning the straitjackets and other restraints as a sign that change had really begun. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I am absolutely in awe of, of this story and it has a it has a real it has a real personal resonance for me. My my great grandfather uh, was once uh, an inmate, and um, yeah, melancholy tending toward outbursts in the in the thirties. So he would have been a um, he might he might have been a little bit tied up. So uh, seeing the picture of the straitjackets burning is is pretty powerful for, mm -hmm. for me, even though I didn't know uh, Heinrich personally. It, it feels he's there in the back of my mind and it's, it, it matters. Thank you. But I can invite our next friend, Carrie Griffith, uh, who writes both historical fiction and nonfiction titles about Minnesota and often takes us to fascinating uh, wilderness regions of the state. And he also has uh, particularly timely, uh, given things on the West Coast happening right now, chat to share with us. Thanks. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Susan. That was a great presentation and really interesting. I, I really recommend that book. And I've always loved the Unitarians. Let's just say another, another reason to love them. Today, I'm gonna to talk about my most recent book, Gunflint Burning Fire in the Boundary Waters. I'm gonna tell a little bit about the, the actual book, the writing of the book, and then read briefly from the prologue. Um, 
I, when I do these presentations, I like to show this map. And the map, uh, I like it because it shows the international border. It gives readers and viewers an idea of where uh, the Ham Lake fire of 2007, and that's what the book is about, uh, actually happened. It was way up on the northern border, it, most of it in the Boundary Waters, but not all of it. Uh, the brown area here is the actual uh, area burned by the Ham Lake fire. The green area is the Cavity Lake fire, which actually happened the previous July. That's another reason I like this map, because the Cavity Lake fire burned about 45,000 acres. When it burned the previous July, um, it was the largest forest fire in Minnesota in almost a century, and you can see it was subsequently dwarfed by the Ham Lake fire. I like this map too because it shows you the Gunflint Trail, which is the major uh, road, blacktop road that goes up into the Boundary Waters. This is the boundary for the Boundary Waters right here. Uh, it was burned over in the fire and the fire burned a lot of structures and m almost all of them were right around the Gunflint Trail. Now, uh, before I ever thought about writing a book on the Ham Lake Fire, coincidentally, about 10 days after the fire had burned through the area, my wife and I were doing a hike up at the Magnetic uh, Rock Trail. Some of you may know about that. You go drive about 50 miles up the Gunflint, and you can do this beautiful hike back into the um, woods. Unfortunately, on this day, this was right after the fire went through, and the only way I can describe that entire area that had been burned over by the Ham Lake fire is post-apocalyptic. It just looked awful. Uh, but I also took this picture. These are fern fronds pushing up out of the ashes, and it was a reminder that, you know, forest fires have been happening up north for millennia. They actually serve a valuable ecological purpose. Uh, for example, um, jack pines and black spruce have something called serotonous pine cones, and they actually don't even open and propagate and spread their seeds until they feel the heat from a forest fire. So forest fires do play a, a major role in the ecology and the forest ecology up there. Of course, the Ham Lake fire was way out of hand and it uh, was very destructive. Now, when the editor of my first two books suggested I write a book about the Ham Lake Fire, I thought, well, that must be because the Ham Lake Fire was the largest forest fire in Minnesota history. And so I started doing some research, and if you, this, this is in order, this list is in order by number of acres burned, you can see it wasn't in the top five, it wasn't in the top 10, it was number 12 on the overall list of forest fires in Minnesota, and I thought, well, why would I want to write a book about the 12th largest forest fire in Minnesota history? But the more research I did, the more I realized this was really a book-worthy project. And uh, a few of the reasons were um, this list implies, because the Ham Lake fire uh, was the largest forest fire when it happened in almost a century, uh, it implies uh, a different a story between historical forest management and the way uh, forest fires are fought and contemporary forest management and forest fire fighting. And that intrigued me. That's definitely a story I wanted to tell in the book. It also said over here that there were no fatalities in the Ham Lake fire. I beg to differ. I think there was one fatality and that's a story I tell in the book. And if you look at this list, almost every fire that happens up north is started by lightning. And the, the, the one exception on this list is the Ham Lake fire. It was started by a camper and a campfire. And I wanted to know more about that story. And that's one of the stories I tell in the book. Now, by the numbers, the Ham Lake fire burned for 13 days. It burned 76,000 acres. Uh, it destroyed 144 structures, it did $100 million in damages, and the firefighting costs alone were $12 million. Now this is a fire progression map that the Forest Service actually puts out. And it's interesting because each day it shows you a different 
uh, part of the, that of the forest that the fire burned. It started right here on uh, May 5th, 2007. Weather played a really big role in the in this fire. And the when that started uh, by a camper right in Ham Lake, uh, the winds were gusting at 20 to 30 miles an hour out of the east southeast. Now, everybody thought that was a great deal. You can see it pushed it about two miles in the shape of a cigar at two miles west. Everybody thought it was great because as soon as it hit this area, remember this was the Cavity Lake fire from the previous July. As soon as it hit that fire remnant, they thought that, you know, it would be robbed of uh, burnable fuel and it would burn itself out. Now, unfortunately, in a real stroke of fate, the, um, the wind shifted over the night. And instead of coming out of the east, southeast, they came out of the due south. And the entire right forest flank became the forest fire front. Uh, the fire flank became the fire front. And it pushed up that first day all the way up. This is the Gunflint Trail right here. It pushed up and it burned its first structures that day. Now the next full day, it burned up here in lots of structures. That's when it did the most damage. Now I'm gonna to read to you from the prologue and the gentleman uh, that, I re that I wrote about in the prologue is, a, is an 84 year old guy by the name of Bob Monahan who li lived up Sag Lake Trail, that's right here. And in the wee hours of that second full day of the fire, he refused to be evacuated. Almost everybody up here evacuated, except for Bob and a handful of other people. Bob stayed behind because he had a sprinkler system that he fired up and tended and made sure it worked on his property to spread uh, water around it. He lived on Sag Lake, an arm of Sag Lake, and um, it pulled water from the, the lake and spread it all around his property. And, but there was on the south side of his building, you can see the fire is moving north on this second full day. On the south side of his building, the, um, the, he had to water it down by hand. So I'm gonna pick up the story with um, Bob Monahan. Uh, in the middle of the night, he hears an explosion just south of him, and uh, it's his neighbors about 100 miles, uh, 100 yards south. It's his um, fuel tank exploding because it's been engulfed in the fire, and the fire's headed straight towards Bob. He's been working all day. He's exhausted. He's on his couch. He falls asleep, and about 1.30 in the morning, he's awakened by this blast and he realizes the fire is just about upon him. The sound wakened Bob like a face slap. He sat upright, wondering if his own propane tank had blown. Outside, it sounded like a locomotive was roaring toward his walls. His windows were filled with an intense yellow light. He looked at his watch and saw 1.30 a.m. and pulled himself up off the couch. He hurried to the door and peered through the glass panes. The sky was filled with smoke and flames. The place where his neighbor's 55 gallon gas tank had been 100 yards south was burning like a devil's torch. Across Sag Lake Channel, it looked like the whole world was on fire. Judging from the spike in flames, he knew the inferno had claimed his neighbor's cabin. Now he could hear the front edge of the yellow rage emboldened by the taste of fuel, preternatural in the heart of the night. Bob crossed the room, grabbed his hard hat, and pushed open his door. He was struck by the noise and wind like a screaming freight train in his face. The fire was close and roaring straight toward him. He hurried to the side of his house, picked up his hose, peering over his shoulder as he flipped down the water and waited for the spray to gush out. He doused the entire length of his house before turning to have a better look. The fire had already reached the forested ridgeline 50 feet south. The scream obliterated all other sound. 
The firestorm was creating its own weather system, and now the hot wind drove the flame straight at him, charging through the trees and underbrush. The light and heat was intense, but the omnipresent sprinkler heads continued shooting a phalanx of spray that kept the worst of the smoke and heat at bay, enabling Bob to breathe. He watched red embers rising out of the fierce wall of flames, but the wet air doused them before they could land. The steady thrumming of his sprinkler system was holding, though he could not hear it over the roar. He turned back to the house, soaking it in a thick spray of lake water, traversing its entire two-story length with his back tensed against the oncoming fire. When he finally turned, what he saw staggered him. A 40-foot wall of flame silhouetted the trees in yellow light, their branches beyond a sprinkler spray succumbing to the hungry fire. 20-foot trees were lighting the night like giant Roman candles. A hot wind fanned the painful to the ears scream. The heat, light, and sound would have driven most people to drop everything, fight their way to the waiting boat, toss the lines, roar the engine to life, and race up Saganaga's arm into the hoped-for safety of the big open water. But Bob Monahan wasn't going to leave his place. He turned his back to the fire, ignoring the rising scream, and kept the water pulsing along the south side of his house, hoping he would not need a miracle to survive. And that's the end of the prologue. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, Wendy, the floor is to you. As Amelia just said in, in, the, in the chat, that is one heck of a harrowing situation to find oneself in. I was just sitting here going, and? and, and. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think I, I think I should read this book because I remember the summer that, that this was going on, but I, yeah, the, the human element always adds something. So Definitely. thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Professor Christopher Lehman, who teaches uh, in the Ethnic Studies Department at St. Cloud State University. He is the author of last year's Minnesota Nonfiction Award winner, Slavery's Reach. So welcome, Christopher. Thank you. It's an honor to be doing this event and I'm excited to talk about the book. It's a book that took five years of research, but it was on top of about 12 or 13 years of research that I had already been doing. I've been living in Minnesota for 18 years now. And ever since I moved here, I had been interested in local history. And when I was looking up the presence of slavery in Minnesota 18 years ago, what I was trying to do was to see if I could find any instances of people who used to be kept in slavery who were living in Minnesota or people who might have been kept in slavery in Minnesota when they weren't supposed to be. But the research that I was doing was not producing very many tangible results. And then about five years ago, I figured out that one way to trace slavery was by following the paper trail of money. And the best way to find, at least in Minnesota, which was a free state and a free territory, a money trail about slavery was through real estate deeds. So I went to county recorder offices for counties that were by the Mississippi River because the Mississippi River connecting the North and the South was the way in which most people from the South came up to Minnesota. So I would spend about anywhere from a couple hours to an entire morning and afternoon's worth in Washington County or Ramsey County, Hennepin County, lots of time in Stearns County since that's where I live, also in Benton County, Wright County and so forth. And since legal slavery ended in 1865, I would look at the counties that definitely existed before 1865 and I would go to the deeds. And I would see how many deeds before 1865 
came from buyers who were listed as being from the South. And I would write down the names of the Southerners and I would write down where they were from. Then after writing down all the Southerners from all the deeds I could find before 1865, then I would go home and I would look at the slave schedules, which came with the census in 1850 and 1860. And slave schedules had lists of names of Southern slaveholders. So if any of the names that I had written down from the deeds matched any of the names of people who were listed as slaveholders, then that was my paper trail. And there were quite a few that I found. And my writing of slavery's reach was my attempt to make sense of all of that. So what I will do now is share some of the things that I have found in my research. So here, for example, is a digitization of one of the deeds that I found. Now, back when I was doing the research, I had to physically drive to all the county recorder offices. But Family Search has digitized quite a few of them. This is from Stearns County. And for those of you who cannot read the cursive, the person who is selling land is named John Wilson. He's considered one of the founders of St. Cloud, in the county of Stearns, territory of Minnesota. And then the people that he's selling to are James L. Orr and Augustus M. Smith. Apparently the person did not know what county they were from, but they, they definitely came from the state of South Carolina. So James Orr and Augustus Smith were definitely both slaveholders, very massive slaveholders. And James L. Orr also was a member of Congress at the time. He was a Speaker of the House. And if you remember over the summer when the current Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, took down the paintings of slaveholders who were speakers, James Orr was one of the people whose paintings were taken down. And so this is the deed for land that Orr and Smith bought from John Wilson. And it's dated from July of 1857. And then the next deed after that is John Wilson selling to a man named Fountain Beatty from Greenville County in South Carolina. And Fountain Beatty held quite a few slaves as well. And so whenever these slaveholders bought land in Minnesota, money from slavery became part of the economy. And so the deeds illustrate that. In addition to looking at the deeds, another thing that I would do was to look at newspaper accounts of the travels of these people. So for example, when I was looking at James Orr and the visits that he took, I tried to see if I could find any press coverage of that. And it was looking at newspaper accounts of Orr's travels that I stumbled upon probably what is the most infamous account in the book, Slavery's Reach, which is that of Orr's traveling partner, William Aiken, who was also from South Carolina and who was also a congressman. Now, when Aiken traveled to Minnesota in 1856, one of the things that he saw in Minnesota was the University of Minnesota, which had been shut down for about two years. And it opened in 1851 and it closed in 1854. When Aiken saw it in 1856, he decided that he would loan $15,000 to the U of M on the spot. And $15,000 then translates to about a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. But the reason that Aiken could drop that much money on the spot is because he held over 700 people as slaves. And so he loaned the money. And then the following year in 1857, he came back to Minnesota and cashed out half his loan. But that still left $8,000 for the U of M to owe. 
And then the Civil War happened. And by then, the U of M had closed again. It had burned through the money pretty quickly. But the U of M still owed Aiken. And now that the Civil War has happened, Aiken is living in a Confederate state. And Minnesota is trying to figure out a way in which they don't have to pay back the money to Aiken now that he lives in an enemy country. So in 1862, one year after the war begins, the Minnesota legislature passes the Rebellion Act. And under the Rebellion Act, a Confederate resident cannot go to Minnesota's courts and sue. So if Aiken wanted to get his money back, now he could not. And so that $8,000 loan effectively turned into a donation against Aiken's will. And there was not very much paperwork from the U of M that I could find on that, certainly not in recent years, but I think the last U of M document that had mentioned Aiken by name was in 1863, the year after the Rebellion Act. And this is from the Board of Regents and their report about the U of M. And I think on page seven of this report, that's where Aiken is mentioned. Okay, so here it says on of the issue of bonds, $15,000 total, $8,000 were held prior to the present rebellion by ex-governor Aiken of South Carolina. And I've always found the language of that interesting because by saying that $8,000 came from Aiken prior to the rebellion, it implies that the money's not Aiken's anymore now that the rebellion or the civil war is taking place. And one of the reasons, of course, is because of the Rebellion Act. So that's probably the, the most interesting thing that I found that I definitely made a point of putting into the book. Another thing that I thought was interesting was looking at hotel records, because whenever Southerners came to Minnesota to buy land, they had to stay somewhere. And there were quite a few hotels that were along the Mississippi River. And Minnesota had quite a tourist economy at the time. And one of the things about Minnesota that most people I don't think realize is that when the Dred Scott decision in 1857 said that a slave master can take a slave to any territory, that included Minnesota because Minnesota was still a territory. It was not yet a state. So, in 1857, in March of 1857, slavery became legal in Minnesota, and it stayed legal for 14 months until Minnesota finally became a free state in 1858. But during that time in 1857, when it was legal, there was quite an influx of Southerners in Minnesota buying land. The deeds that I had read earlier were from 1857. And so James Orr and Augusta Smith were part of that wave of people coming into Minnesota to buy land and bringing slaves with them because they knew they could. This has ramifications as well in terms of public safety because that same summer of 1857, Minnesota actually had a very small slave riot, if you will. So an old newspaper, the St. Cloud Advertiser, reported that somebody had tried to liberate a slave who was from Tennessee from the master who brought him from Tennessee to a hotel in Minnesota, in St. Cloud specifically, at the Stearns house. And according to this newspaper article, the law and order people, I guess what would have been the police back then, turned out in great numbers and prevented the outrage upon our laws from being consummated. So that's important to keep in mind because in 1857, again, slavery is legal. So anyone 
who's in law enforcement, any police officer, has to defend a slaveholder's right to enslave in Minnesota. So for the police to capture the runaway slave and bring that slave back was in line with what was the law back then. Now, once Minnesota becomes a free state, there's a problem for the tourism business because now they're worried that Southerners won't want to come to Minnesota anymore. However, there were people in Minnesota who were in government who had been paid by slaveholders. Some of our founding fathers, like Henry Sibley and Henry Rice, worked for American Fur. And the American Fur Company was actually owned by slaveholders from St. Louis, Missouri. And so these people were getting paid, even though they lived hundreds of miles away from a slave state. And in fact, Henry Sibley, who was the first governor of the state of Minnesota, was still working for those slaveholders at the time that he was governor. So since he was doing that, the enforcement of the law was definitely going to be compromised. And so dependent was Minnesota on the slave economy that two years after it became a free state, some lawmakers in Minnesota tried to make Minnesota's slave state after it had been a free state. And in my book, it says, Senator Charles McCubbin, originally from the slave state of Maryland, presented a bill that championed the cause of slavery. Although he had chosen to live without slaves, that did not mean he opposed the institution. Slavery had given him a childhood of privilege and it supported his widowed mother and siblings. Moreover, his fellow native Marylanders, William Sprig Hall and Harwood Eigelhart, his business partners, and in the case of Eigelhart, his cousin, still participated in slavery, as did their families. With McCubbin's proposal, he was asking Minnesota to respect the practice that gave his friends and family a living. A similar bill was introduced in the Minnesota House of Representatives by Daniel A. Robertson, an ally of Henry Rice. The patience of state legislators of both parties regarding local slavery had worn thin by then, but one-fifth of the lawmakers, each one a Democrat, voted for the bill. The Senate rejected McCubbin's proposal 29 to 5, and the vote revealed a political split between its Maryland-born members. Hall voted against it, despite his history as a slaveholder, thus opposing his fellow Southerner and real estate partner, McCubbin. The House also dismissed the proposal 51 to 18, but among those who voted for the passage were local profiteers from slavery. Representative George W. Sweet of Benton County had sold thousands of dollars in land to enslavers just three summers earlier. And Representative Oscar Stevenson, a native of Virginia, had promoted his Minnesota-based business in a Southern newspaper. So there was quite a bit of investment that people had with slavery. There were quite a few things that people just didn't want to give up as a result of Minnesota having been rich from slavery for so long. Thank you. Always, always follow the money. And <laughs> that's, 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 it's fascinating. It is, it is, a, I haven't, I'm going to be honest, I haven't read the book yet, but I really, really, especially want to now, like, all of the, the, the details that you bring up and the, and the research path that you went down, to find these things is super amazing and uh, right, right where it needs to be. So thank you, thank you very much for, for being here and sharing that. I was just like, what else are you going to come? What else are you gonna find? What else are you gonna find? What else are you gonna find? I was just right there with you. It's amazing, it's, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, so our last speaker of this, first half is Andrea Swenson, whose brain certainly must be a fascinating catalog of Minnesota music history, and she is the author of Got to Be Something Here, and I'm really pleased to bring her this afternoon. So, Andrea, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Um, I've had so many personal connections to things that have been talked about so far today. Uh, I grew up in Moose Lake, Minnesota, which is 
home of one of the most historic um, fires in the state of Minnesota. And my father and uh, grandfather both worked at the state hospital there. So um, I'm just really fascinated to learn everything that's been shared so far today. And I hope I can add something that uh, you find interesting from my research as well. So um, my job is, uh, I, I'm a writer, but I also work at a radio station. I work at Minnesota Public Radio's The Current. And over the course of my career, I've written for print newspapers. I've um, done this work for the radio station. And I have also ventured now into writing more long form um, historical nonfiction as an author. And all the while, my specialty has been on Minnesota music. And you cannot really focus in on Minnesota music as your uh, main area of expertise without learning a lot about prints. So that is where my curiosity began when it came time to look towards a longer project that I might want to pursue. And back in 2014 now, I started working on my first book, uh, Got to Be Something Here, The Rise of the Minneapolis Sound. So I'm going to share a little bit of a presentation. There's so many stories in this book. I wish I could just get into all of it, but I, I'm just going to focus on one or two for now. Um, this is the cover of my book. Um, so as I mentioned, the interest for me starts with Prince. Um, this is a picture of Prince uh, in 1988 on the Love Sexy tour. And he actually had custom suits made for this tour with Minneapolis on the sleeve of his jacket. And that just says so much to me about how important Minneapolis was to him. He actually, when he toured Japan on this tour, he had them translate Minneapolis to Japanese and, and print it on the jackets he wore on that part of the tour. So my curiosity started with Prince's connection to Minneapolis and the importance of Minneapolis in his life. And from there, it quickly went back through history to all of these incredible R&B and funk and soul and gospel bands who made music in the three decades prior to Prince becoming a, a household name. And the reason why my research took this turn is because um, I had heard many people have the same reaction when they were thinking of Prince saying, oh, you know, for someone that didn't live in Minnesota, like people didn't even really associate Minnesota as a place that had like a large black population and would even have a vibrant community of black artists that he could have emerged from. He seemed like an anomaly to outsiders who weren't very well versed to, in this period of Minnesota history. And so my book uh, research really set out to disprove that assumption that Prince was actually just one of so many um, members of the Twin Cities music community that were part of this really vibrant African-American musical tradition. So um, one of my favorite things that I discovered fairly early on in my research is that uh, Prince Actually, so he was born in 1958. He spent a lot of his childhood growing up in North Minneapolis. And the very same year that Prince was born, the first R&B record was made in Minnesota. And it was recorded in a house in a basement studio, just mere blocks from where Prince lived as a baby. And I found the band. They're called the Big M's. Um, I'm, I've become kind of an obsessive record collector through this whole process and just through the nature of my work, I actually um, got a copy of the record um, by the Big M's. I'll show it to you. And it's just such an, a fascinating piece of history. Um, and I, I got to interview a couple of the surviving members of the Big M's and also the person that made this record, whose name is David Hursk. Uh, unfortunately, David passed away a few years ago while I was still researching my book, but I was just so grateful to be able to interview him and collect some of his memories before that. And David was a teenager in North Minneapolis, and he um, was part of the Jewish community that had settled in that area back in the 40s and 50s. It was a very uh, vibrant community of Jewish families and a lot of Jewish-owned businesses, and then this growing Black population. And um, now we're learning a lot more about why those two communities specifically were in North Minneapolis in that era because of um, red, redlining and, and racist housing covenants. But these two communities were really um, intermingled when um, David was a teenager and as these bands were starting to emerge. So he was the person to really capture 
the first sounds of um, what would eventually evolve into the Minneapolis sound. Um, so here's a little map I made. Um, this is where David Hersk's house was in near North Minneapolis. And this is where Prince's house was. So literally, you know, as you can see, about six blocks apart, which is just really incredible to think about both of those things being born at the same time. This is a picture of um, Plymouth Avenue back in the uh, 60s. This was a really, as I mentioned, vibrant neighborhood full of a lot of Jewish owned businesses and also home to a really great jazz club called the Blue Note. This is a picture I found that's from a little bit later in the timeline, but of um, musicians playing at the Blue Note. So this was kind of the heart of this community. And a lot of times if like a famous jazz player came through town, they would go hang out at the Blue Note after their other gig. If they played at a theater or somewhere, they, the Blue Note is where all the musicians would go and jam late into the night. Another venue that I became really fascinated by was called uh, King Solomon's Mines. And this venue was actually located in the Fauché Tower, which I found so fascinating. Um, if you're familiar with downtown Minneapolis and the Fauché Tower, there is a restaurant there now. It's called Keys. It's one of the Keys chain of restaurants. And in the late 60s, for a very short period of time, it was only open in this way for about 18 months. It became the spot where you could go and see the coolest funk and soul and R&B bands as they were coming up in the Twin Cities. I love everything about this picture. There's so much emotion. There's so much history in this photo. Um, I found another couple pictures that also capture kind of the vibe of King Solomon's Minds. Um, this is Maurice McKinney's, who was kind of a, a, a huge star in the scene back in the day. And this is what it looked like from the outside um, as you're walking downtown and coming up on the Fauché Tower. So King Solomon's Mines was interesting, not just because it became such a hub for that community and really an incubator for this kind of music that was starting to really gel, but it also faced incredible amounts of discrimination and pressure from city officials because it attracted a mixed audience. And it was not really common at that point in time that there were bars that would host live music in downtown Minneapolis. And as I started doing more and more research and interviewing these artists who played at these different venues, I heard the same story repeated again and again. And they all said, you couldn't have more than one Black person in your band and get booked to play a show in downtown Minneapolis. And I heard this from artists who played back in the 60s, who played in the 70s, who even played in the 80s, that there was an impenetrable barrier for artists of color to play downtown Minneapolis. And King Solomon's Mines was the first place that really went against that and started booking these incredible R&B bands and drawing in these mixed audiences. And the city didn't like it. So eventually, uh, actually not very long from when it opened and became a hotspot for musicians, it was raided. Uh, the city had started giving the owner warnings and then eventually came in one night and raided it and took a bunch of people out and brought them to the precinct downtown and said, um, we're shutting, we're going to suspend your liquor license because we found that you had underage drinkers in your club. Well, lo and behold, once the, um, so supposedly underage attendees got to the precinct. They were all able to prove that they actually were of age. It was quite a bogus reason to apply this much pressure and to terrify all the patrons of this club, but it did successfully allow the city council to approve the suspension of the liquor license and they had to stop hosting live music. The musicians were furious. They actually all attended a city council meeting that was held at nine in the morning. I, I looked up the minutes and they talk about all these musicians coming in wearing sunglasses at nine in the morning to protest what had happened to this club that was so important to them. And this is just one of a 40 page long petition that uh, people signed, not just the musicians and people that frequented the club, but also I found players on the Minnesota Vikings had signed this, um, people that worked in the media at the time, anchors from KSTP, um, journalists from the Star Tribune. It was clearly uh, a really important place 
for the community, the larger community um, that was interested in music in the Twin Cities. So that was just, an. this is just so fun to me to find something like this. Um, this I actually got directly from the records um, that they keep for the city council and this was scanned in as part of their files. Um, so in the late 60s, it started this conversation. What, what happened at King Solomon's Mines and what is going on in downtown Minneapolis? And the media actually started to cover it as a topic for the first time and talk about racism in the music scene in the Twin Cities. And it's really interesting to see at this point, there's a bit of a shift in the public understanding of what musicians were going through just to try to make music. So, um, and here's another quote that kind of emphasizes that point. Uh, one thing I found really particularly uh, noteworthy in the, all of the reporting around King Solomon's Mines and this era is that the Minneapolis Police Department had something called the Flying Morals Squad that was supposed to be um, positioned downtown to clean up downtown and make it more moral. And you can read a lot between the lines about what they meant about that. So what does this all have to do with Prince? Well, here's Prince standing downtown as he's getting photographed for the first time. Uh, this was kind of an iconic photo shoot for him. There's another photo of him standing in front of this wall down on Ninth and Marquette that was one of his first publicity photos ever as he was signing to Warner Brothers. Well, because Prince came up in this neighborhood, he was so uh, enmeshed in all of these experiences that musicians just one generation older than him were going through as they were trying to make music. And Prince was very attuned to this. Um, all of the experiences that Prince had as a young person were all right in this same area of North Minneapolis. And my book goes into a lot of research about these different spots. But basically, these are the most significant community centers and um, his friends' houses where he started making music as a teenager. And it was always known by all of all of his generation of young kids that downtown Minneapolis was an area that they were going to have to really work at if they were going to try to break through this barrier and try to play. So when he got to work forming his first band, he was very sure to make sure that he had um, Jewish and white and black members in his band. He, that was always a big priority for him. And as he was coming up and trying to book more gigs and break out of this little bubble that he and his friends were in in North Minneapolis, he also watched one of his peers, Cynthia Johnson, who used to play in a band that would share bills with Prince's band when he was in high school. She sang the vocals on one of the state's most uh, best-selling songs, Funky Town by Lips, Inc., Cynthia played, uh, sang the lead vocals, I should say. She was a session player, brought in just to add her vocals to the mix. And when that song was released in 1980, shot to number one on every chart, but when the video hit MTV, this is how the vocalist was portrayed in the media. And I believe that all of these factors led to Prince making some pretty striking statements as he was setting off on his career. This is a statement that he gave to the president of Warner Brothers Records as they were signing him. They were still in the process of finalizing all the details and he was insisting, you know, as a 19 year old that he was going to produce his own album and play every instrument himself. And as they're in the studio talking about all of this, he turned to the executive and said, don't make me black. I make music for everybody. And he went on to list all of the artists that he wanted to be considered as their, his peer, um, the Beatles, Eric Clapton, Carlos Santana, Jimi Hendrix. He saw this divide in the music industry in how people were marketed and what audiences they thought that they would be receptive toward. And he wanted to fight against that. And I, I don't think you can understand exactly how Prince became that headstrong and that confident in what he was doing and, and how he wanted to change the industry without learning about this complicated history of racism in the Minnesota music scene. So the story ends with um, Prince getting booked to play First Avenue for the first time. And in the early 80s, First Avenue uh, was known as Sam's, actually, had previously been known as Uncle Sam's, then Sam's, and then would become First Avenue. 
it was a hotbed for incredible punk music and most of the bands that were playing there in that era especially in the seven street entry were white husker du huge influential punk band coming out of minneapolis in that time the replacements another band that still to this day people talk about being such a historically significant band and in march of 1981 prince played first avenue for the first time and he brought together all of these different influences. He brought together the R&B and soul and gospel influences that he learned and was steeped in coming up in North Minneapolis. He combined it with punk. You can see the little studs on his jacket and the leather or the leopard print guitar strap and new wave and rock and roll, classic rock. And he combined it all together to make something truly new. And that is what we think of when we describe, you know, that Minneapolis sound. It's this combination of all of these different influences. And it's trying to make music that can appeal to a broad cross-section of people and not get um, placed into these segregated um, barriers that have been so um, present in the music industry for so long. So that's a little bit of my spiel. Um, I... I love talking about this. I could talk about it forever, but that's just a little bit of what is in my book. Thanks a whole bunch, Andrea. I I don't think my mom is out there right now, but I kind of, I'm okay with that because I might buy your book for her. She lived with a family in uh, the early 70s in North Minneapolis as she was teaching. Um, and they had a family R&B band that played various backyard concerts and, and what have you. And so I'm like, man, she was in that, that cauldron of really amazing musical experiences. And I think she might really appreciate you know, your perspectives on, on how that all sorted out and became what you know what became of the Minneapolis sound and, and prints and all of yeah. those things so yeah fascinating stuff so uh if I could invite everybody uh to to show up here we're going to ask a question uh, of everyone and if the uh the audience has anything now is a great time to to throw those in the chat and I will relay questions as they come uh, but our, the question we'll start with is, you know, as, as writers of, of history, both, you know, most, mostly in, a, in a, an academic or, or popular context, we're kind of living in a moment that people are going to write about. Uh, and I'm wondering if that gives you a particular perspective on, on some of the things that we're dealing with right now. You want people to just jump in? Just, just jump in. Just go for it. Okay. I'm the senior member of this group. I will <laughs> jump in. <laughs> um, well, I think I I, I um, mentioned a little bit of the relevance when I was talking with the say your name, because the the um, the situation. Um, for mentally ill people, many of whom would not be considered mentally ill now that who were in those hospitals. Many of them were just misfits or um, troublemakers or 30% of them were senile elderly. But the, the, the shame that people felt and the, um, for being in that category and the categorization and then the um, cruel treatment um, as if they had no value is very similar to some of our current um, racial uh, justice issues with, with that kind of um, devaluation of, of human beings so that they had no um, um, they had no importance they 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 weren't people and um, what I found relevant 
so much with with uh, Angla refused that kind of characterization. And she saw her own dad in, in the faces of all the people that she cared for and she fought. So that's one relevance of when you dehumanize humans, um, whether it's for racial reasons or behavioral reasons or, um, you know, there's any number of reasons that people people get categorized in that way. Um, the, the need to fight and the challenge of the fight and the need to fight, it never ends. Um, and that's the message when I talk to mental health advocates, which is relevant to advocacy for any kind of social justice movement. There is no end. Minnesota, um, with this great history, um, within, within 10 years had lost that edge and had fallen back to the average. And so the other message is the fight never ends and the advocates always have to be there. And, um, and each step is, is an important one. So um, I, I see this, this book as having, um, as having an inspirational uh, um, aspect. Um, here was Angla, she had no, she had no um, uh, limited education, no money. She was an unmarried, you know, in her 40s when she was, was doing this, uh, considered of very little importance. Um, she fought everyone all the way up to the top. <laughs> she was intrepid um, and she never gave up. And for those reasons, I think there's a, a lot of value beyond Minnesota um, to, to um, advocates everywhere for social justice. I, I would just, you know, it's really interesting hearing all of you guys talk about your different times. And I, I'd say, you know, we've sort of covered the last century and a half, right? Christopher going way back, Susan uh, beyond that, Andrea, Andrea going, you know, a little more contemporaneously and me uh, more currently. But what's interesting is we've all used individuals in the era and their voices and actions and everything to tell whatever story we're trying to tell. And you know what intrigues me about applying that to today is that people are here today and they are making, you know, they're gonna be uh, the newsmakers of tomorrow. So somebody looking back on 2020 you know, through a filter of say a decade or two decades from now, is going to be doing the same thing. Uh, somebody trying to tell that story of 2020 is doing the same thing that we are all doing. Um, it, but they'll be they'll have the benefit of the filter. You know, back then, back. I mean, Andrea, when you were talking, I was really intrigued by seeing those early pictures of Prince, and you know, before he ever became the person that he subsequently became and particularly that story when he was 19 and he was and same Christopher going way back and finding those really intriguing um, anecdotes so it, you know ever, historians always rely on something like that that's just sort of the the obtuse esoteric response to your question Well, certainly over the summer, there has been a lot more attention given to my book. And what I've noticed is that when people, at least on social media, have tried to make sense of the George Floyd killing, they often do so with a misunderstanding of history. And a good example of this is when there were people who were criticizing 
the Minneapolis police, some of those critics were talking about the history of law enforcement in general and how there's that there are roots with slave patrols. And some of the critics of those critics clapped back by saying, well, George Floyd was killed in Minnesota. Minnesota never had slavery. And so since my book clearly disproves that, when people start the conversation about George Floyd with something inaccurate about history, it taints the rest of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's where I see discussions about history being especially important so that people can speak with the right information about what's going on today. I've become so fascinated in what one of my librarian friends described as like recent history or new history or however you want to describe like something that happened within the last 50 years because um, there isn't enough distance for people to not still be alive who experienced it firsthand but it is enough distance for people who are in generations coming up right now that they may not know anything about it so it's this really interesting balancing point and I was really surprised there's so many parallels between the research that I did for this period, which was the 50s through the early 80s, particularly in the late 60s in Minneapolis. There's so many parallels between what's been happening in Minneapolis these last few years. And it was hard to find comprehensive histories written about it. I was going to like students graduate thesis papers to find more information and combing the archives of the Star Tribune, which uh, I thought was pretty funny. They digitized their archives literally the month after I handed in my manuscript. So I, I was actually going into the microfilm rooms at the library yeah. reading. That happened to me too. <laughs> I was like, oh, you can search by keyword, what? Um, but it was, it was a lot of, you know, piecing together things. And then, um, you know, as you said, Carrie, talking to the people who experienced this and trying to bring in their voices and their perspectives and, and triangulate all these little pieces of history. But I think it's just so important to do that work and to encourage people to seek out this information because there's just so many circular patterns that we've been in that I just feel like I have such a, a deeper understanding of what's going on in this present moment, you know, down to you know, when, um, when unrest has been happening in the Twin Cities and protesters go out and march onto 94 in St. Paul, and they're actually standing on the ground where Rondo used to be and where people's homes used to be in this historic African-American neighborhood. Like, that is just such a significant moment. And to know the history and understand what's happening, it just, I feel like we could all just be so much more empathetic um, to everything that's unfolding around us if, if we take the time to, to understand what happened even just a, a few decades ago. Thank you everyone for, the, for that. I really, I mean, you all hit on something that's very important to me as kind of, you know, an armchair historian, I guess, is that I, you, you can't, you can't start the conversations from, from the wrong, the wrong place, as, as Christopher said, there's so much that we need to ground ourselves in that's just right there under the surface. And I, you know, the kind of connection with, with 94 and Rondo uh, also hit me recently. Like it's right, like I, this is, it is my neighborhood. I live, I, I live in the, the Midway neighborhood. And so I, you know, think about, Think about that as I as I drive through the the areas just south of where I live and you know where 94 is now and yeah it's all it's all right there and the importance of the individual stories as they come up and I it's I that's what that's what I love about reading the past whether it is the more recent past or whether it you know it is finding the human threads that sort of pull us all together. It's great. It's, yeah, I really appreciate all of you for bringing those things together. 
Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot from, from our audience friends, but I think I would like to ask one more thing before we wrap. Um, as someone who does is prone to falling down research rabbit holes, are, are you are you all is the which part is which part is is better to you like the pulling it all together as a, a writer or the um, or the um, the re the research portion and someone has raised their hand and I got distracted there sorry <laughs> um, and I try to get in touch with with Bob here but feel feel free to, to chime in as I do that. I'd have to say, you know, I write fiction and nonfiction. And I know from talking to you guys that when you're doing nonfiction, you get in these rabbit holes, like you were saying, when, and they're really interesting. And it's almost like you have to do 100% um, of the research to get 10% of the story, which is ultimately what you synthesize and tell. And so, you know, I love it both. I have to say, writing fiction and nonfiction, it's so much easier to write fiction because you're making it all up in your head and you don't <laughs> have all that research to do. But, I, but you really do love the research. And I suspect it's the same for all of you. Just hearing you guys talk about you know, the fondness you have for your subject and stuff, I, I, I'd be surprised if anybody said, oh, I hated the research, I spent all the time, you know, so that might. Well, I, I love the research and I don't think you can do the writing until you've gotten so deep in. Uh, primarily for me, it was trying to understand people's motives and to understand the context in which they were, they were operating and digging and finding these people that no one had ever written about before. Um, no one knew those names. Um, I've never, I mean, I've never had more fun in my life. I spent 20 years of my career as an academic and I always had research assistants and nobody was talking about in the health policy world I lived in, people. It was all, you know, um, the policy world and it was data and all this other stuff. And I really believe after having done this and got to do the research myself, which was so satisfying, is people make all the difference. It's all about human beings. It's not about these sort of big cataclysm things, you know, it's people. And some of the people are people like Angela, who, you know, is, is as ordinary as you come, and yet is an extraordinary person. So, so finding about people, whether it's the people in the north side, or, you know, the guy standing on his house, Monahan, I think you said his name was, you know, or the, the, the people that were operating in Minnesota in ways that people in Minnesota now don't want to even know about, you know, and think they're so, you know, uh, superior to, you know, those Southerners and stuff. Um, I, I just think that's so powerful. And, and those are the stories that make a difference, I think. I feel the same way. My favorite part of my whole process and everything I do is interviewing people. And for the book, because I was covering such a large period of history and because I didn't really know what I was looking for in the beginning, um, I have so many fond memories of sitting at, you know, Perkins with an, you know, an older man, maybe in his seventies and he's retired and he's got four hours to kill. And we just sit at Perkins and the waitress comes and fills our coffee up and He's got his scrapbooks and we're just talking, you know, and um, those are just the wonderful human moments that I always try to bring into everything I do. But it's that that to me makes the history come alive because then you can see it through their eyes and through their memories and um, and then trying to, uh, you know, bring in all these different voices and string it together. That's just, it's just such a great process. And 
I feel like I'm just kind of like a, a vessel for them to travel through, you know, <laughs> and I'm just trying to do my best to authentically um, transmit what they're telling me to the world. I enjoy the research process too. And I think with the virus and the pandemic, I've really missed going to archives and working with archivists. And I miss that because I enjoy sharing with them the things that they're able to help me find. And oftentimes when I read something that they help me locate, I'll contact them or I'll talk to them if I'm in the building with them and say, hey, this is what this document means and you help me to find this. And then they get excited too. And it's fun to, to see other people who are in the same line of work as you be excited about the work that you're doing. Don't get the same kind of effect through email, but at least there's that. It's better than nothing, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, I, yes, because <laughs> I, I, I love trying to emote my extreme excitement through, through text sometimes and just really, yeah, it's not the same. It really, really isn't. Um, well, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap. I, we're, I would love to sit and chat with all of you all day. It's been really a pleasure and I appreciate all of your stories and, and, and your time today. Um, and audience, when you when you get a link from from us, please do take a moment to fill out the brief the brief survey. Uh, our grant funders appreciate having data. Um, again, please visit Next Chapter Booksellers to purchase any of the books that you've heard about today and any other books written by these lovely humans. And I just again thank you to Crookston and the and the Lake Agassiz Regional Library for their partnership on this event and a final thank you to our lovely panelists Susan, Christopher, Carrie, Andrea. Uh, I really, really, really appreciated this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. This is great. It has been delightful, and we will be doing more Moving Words events throughout uh, December, or, or sorry, November. <laughs> I'm just adding more now because it's fun. So uh, I hope we'll we'll hear from you again. Have Thanks. a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye. Bye.